so glad you're with us this morning. It was great worshiping with you, and I know we are not in person together yet, but my heart was united with yours in worshiping the one true king of the universe, Jesus Christ. And man, my spirit is uplifted knowing that whenever and wherever you're watching, we are united in that spirit and that cause of Christ. I encourage you, if you haven't, if you have kids, and maybe even if you don't have kids and just wanna watch, at some point, tune in to our C2 Kids Facebook page to watch their kids' service. It's always fun, it's amazing. Your kids will learn a lot, and what a great way to continue the discipleship of your children, utilizing some of the resources we have as a church and letting us partner with you in that. I know COVID has changed a lot about who we are and how we operate. Uh, as, as a country and as a people, but it hasn't changed us as believers. And our series, This Is Us, is really about celebrating and diving into what it means to be a holy people, what the resurrection, this is why we started it right after Easter, what did the resurrection change about us? When you invited Christ into your life, and I'm speaking to those of you who are Christ followers and certainly those of you watching who aren't, I think there's an opportunity maybe for you to dive into faith this morning. But those of us who are Christ followers, the resurrection changes everything. It changes the nature of every relationship that we are in. So our series, This Is Us, is real relationships in an unreal world. How do we operate according to God's holy standards and holy conduct in a world that's unholy? and really is unreal at times. God's calling us to a greater reality in our relationships, and so that's what we're talking about, the greater reality of the resurrection that brought new life into us, a new heart. We are a new creation, the Bible says. God created a a new humanity through his death and resurrection, and therefore giving us a new community, the community of believers, the community of faith, and we operate in a different way than our world does, than our cultures do. Last week, we talked about marriage from a biblical Christian perspective. I encourage you, if you didn't get to watch, you can go online to our YouTube channel, uh, C2 Church, or watch the Facebook uh, rebroadcast. But we talked last week about Spouses submitting one to one another as unto the Lord in honor and respect, cherishing one another, serving your spouse as Christ loved and served the church. And that marriage is to highlight the love of Christ through your love of your spouse. It's to show the world the love of Christ because you and your spouse love each other in such a unique way. So today we want to talk about Singleness in the church. What does it mean to be single in the church? Oftentimes, marriage is highlighted in the church world and sometimes elevated, but what about those who are single? Well, we're going to dive into that a little bit today. If you're married, we talked last week about building a life that didn't exist when you were single, that, that your married life should look different than your single life did. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way our world operates. In fact, Christ calling us to a different way of operating as a married couple, different than as a single, is very contrary to our world. In fact, sometimes our world creates a problem when we expect to continue our single life under the married status. I've seen so many couples shipwreck their marriage because they want to maintain this self-identity and their, their uh, singlehood within the confines of marriage, and it just creates a lot of conflict. Worldly marriage sometimes is about pursuing your own agenda and your own goals and desires. Simply with a roommate, you tolerate for the benefits of, of getting something from them, love or affection or intimacy. And yet, that's really not what marriage was for. It's the giving up of self for another, that the two would become one, you create a new life. But what does that mean if you're single? What does it mean if you're a single and you're a Christian? Simply, it must, uh, it must be more than simply being alone. It's not a negative thing to, to be alone, but being single as a Christian is more than that. It's more than just to freely pursue every whim or desire with no one or nothing uh, to care for, no restraint, no accountability, free to do whatever you wish. That's not the, the single life that Christ has called those who identify with him to. 
And so today I thought maybe we'd talk about developing a theology of singlehood. Now, if you're married or maybe engaged, don't tune out because I think there's a lot of principles, just as we encouraged single people last week to, to delve into the principles of marriage. So I encourage you in the principles of singlehood and how that applies to each one of us as we pursue Christ. And it's important for the church to develop a, a, a theology of singlehood. So I'm, I'm speaking to those of you who are teenagers. You're young. You're single. You're pre-marriage. Maybe young adults and professionals who maybe are thinking about marriage aren't sure. Maybe those who are widowed or divorced. I want to remind us it's important that we as a church develop this theology of singlehood because we are a body, meaning we each have different roles, different functions. Just like a human body, the church as a body functions with everybody doing their part in their role. So some are married, some are single. And the Bible speaks to each one of those statuses, all equal and all contribute. In Christianity, singleness is not inconsequential. It's not second class or less than or purposeless, okay? That's important to understand because many people think, well, once I get married, then the purpose for my life will begin. No. Just like I, I challenge my teenagers when I was student ministry, don't wait until you're, you're 16 and you have your license, or you're in high school, you're 18 and you go to college and when I get a job, that God's purpose for you is here and now, not just there and then. And so it is with those who are single. Your, single, your status as a single person is full of purpose because of Christ. Because of Christ, your singleness is redeemed, both the act of marriage is redeemed, and singlehood for the purpose of Christ. You see, Christ repaints the picture of marriage and singleness. I like what Tim Keller writes. He, he writes this, Western civilization idolizes individualism and self-realization and views marriage as something to get after reaching a certain point of life. Marriage becomes a means of self-fulfillment and even an idol. Eastern civilization idolizes the family and makes everything revolve around it. Family becomes an idol. Christianity has a unique view of singleness because there is no obligation to get married. Marriage is understood as a temporary earthly institution until the second coming with the new heaven and new earth. For singles who choose to get married, marriage is a sacrament that is meant to be an act of service. Christianity drastically changes both how marriage and singleness should be viewed by its followers. It also emphasizes that marriage will never give you everything that you are looking for in life that can only be found in Christ. This view is different from the world's, of which Christians are called to be set apart from the world while remaining in the world. This is us. We are called to be different. We're called to a different way of thinking and a different way of behaving. We are to be separate in our conduct, in our thought, in our pattern of behavior than the rest of our world and culture. We don't have the same agenda. We don't have the same goals or the same standards. And we should, certainly should not have the same behaviors. What Tim Keller was referring to is the prayer of Jesus for the believers. In John chapter 17, starting in verse 15, in John's gospel, he records Jesus' last prayer as one of for the believers. Verse 15 of chapter 17 in the book of John says, I am not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself so that they too may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus is praying that we would not be removed from the world, but that in the world we would reveal the word of truth, Christ in us, to the rest of the world. And this comes not simply by a faith that cannot be seen, but a faith that is seen through the behaviors and the conduct of the believer. And so we view singleness and marriage and everything through the lens of Scripture, because this is God's guide to relationship with him, to holy conduct. So I thought maybe we'd dive into that this morning with a few points. So I hope you have your Bible, a pen and a pencil, maybe a digital way of, of taking notes with you this morning. The first thing 
I wanna point you to is to the scripture that we're gonna look at, 1 Corinthians chapter seven. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Now, Corinth is, is a um, industrial and economic center of the known world at that time, but it's full of corrupt thinking, very worldly, not too unlike uh, even our own culture and world today. It's very unholy in its conduct, both believers and uh, unbelievers, for those who were single and married. And, and Paul's writings is to bring correction and stability to the church and challenge them in their conduct. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 6, Paul highlights the first thing. Singleness is biblical. Singleness is biblical. So Paul says, now as a concession, not a command, I say this, verse seven, he says, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Paul has just finished a little dissertation about marriage and the two becoming one and kind of what that means for married couples. But then in this next section, he says, I wish as were as I am, and he's highlighting his singleness. He's not commanding or bragging. He simply says, I'm making this concession that not everybody is called to marriage, that singleness is biblical, which was somewhat contrary to the thinking of the time, especially in Jewish culture, that, man, if you weren't married, something was wrong with you. And Paul says, no, make this concession. I'm not commanding you to get married, nor am I commanding you to be single, but I make this concession that not everybody's called to married life. He says, I myself am single, and I wish everyone was like me. And he was talking in in specificity about self-control, that marriage also allowed an expression of sexuality, that those who could not control that should look for a partner. It says, if you can't submit to that kind of self-control, then you need to, God has provided this way to express that. But Paul elevates the, the status of singleness, especially in the church. We will see in the, in, in, later in the chapter why, but he says phrases like, it is good, it is excellent in terms of being single. He says it's a concession and not a commandment. 1 Corinthians 7, 8, he says, to the unmarried, And the widows, I say that is good for them to remain single as I am. So Paul highlights the fact that he was single. He doesn't see this as as a curse. In fact, in verse seven, he says, it is a gift. Verse seven says, I wish that all were as as myself, but each has his own gift from God. He's speaking to singleness. So the second thing I see is singleness is not only biblical, but it is a gift. And maybe in our culture, like in the ancient Jewish culture and in the ancient world, anyone who wasn't married, there was something, there must be something wrong with you. But can I just say, if you're single, it's not a curse. I think in, in, our, in our world, sometimes we have this stereotype of people who are single. You have the, the, the single cat lady who owns like a thousand cats, right? They're, they're lonely. You think of the creeper, or the workaholic who's married to their work and that's all they live for. Or you think of the grouch who has all these regrets at the end of their life. All those are are wildly stereotypical. But singleness is a gift, Paul says. And those of you who are single should see it as that. Even in Christianity, in the church, I don't know if you've experienced this, but you'll have well-meaning people who come up to a single young person, especially maybe in their 20s, and say, so when are you going to get married? That there's some sort of expectation or or biblical obligation to marry. Now, don't get me wrong. Marriage is a wonderful thing. Marriage itself is a gift. The ability to procreate and increase in population, especially those who believe in Christ, that we might fill the world with those who proclaim the goodness of of Christ. That certainly is a gift. But it doesn't devalue those who are single. And so when we say to somebody, well, when are you going to get married, knowing full well they're not dating yet, it's kind of an insult that somehow they've missed God's call on their life. Because we all know how this goes. Certainly, Darcy and I face this, is when are you going to get married? Then when are you going to have kids? 
And when are you going to have grandkids? And it just keeps going. When are you going to retire? When are you going to die? <laughs> okay, maybe not that far, but can I remind you that Jesus himself was single? So uh, it would be prudent to say you're not a freak if you're a single. If you're single, in fact, maybe your response to people should be, you know what, actually, I'm more like Jesus when I'm single. (laughs) Amen, hallelujah. I love the word that Paul uses here. He says it's a gift from God. The the Greek word is charisma, coming from the word charis, this word that means gift of grace. He seems to imply this wholesome inclination given by God either to pursue marriage or to refrain from it. And he's saying some like himself are gifted to be single, that it's a high calling in terms of their pursuit of God to be single, and with it the gift of chastity and self-control. And so I want you, if you're single today, to understand that singleness is a gift and it is a calling. Maybe it's just for a season. Certainly those of you who are young and maybe uh, under 18, 19, or 20, or for my daughters, 35, you're single for a season. You're single for a reason. (laughs) But see your singleness simply as a season that God is leading you maybe through and that it is full of purpose. So some of you are single for a season. And you know that God may lead you to marriage. Maybe that's already in your heart and and you're praying about it. I, I encourage you, those who are thinking about marriage someday, begin to pray for that spouse, that God will bring them to you or lead you to them. Some of you are are single maybe by circumstance, perhaps by divorce or death. Maybe you just simply haven't found a spouse. You're not against marriage, but maybe you just simply haven't found the right one. And God wants you to know that even if you're single by circumstance, he has a great purpose for whether it's a season or for your life. God is not done with his greatest work in you yet. And it may not include bringing a spouse to you. And Paul even writes, he says, those who are widowed, he says, I would encourage you to refrain from remarrying if you can. He's encouraging them and challenging them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But singleness is a calling, maybe it's for a a, a season, by circumstance, or finally, it might be by choice. Paul clearly has given this inclination that he is single by choice. He has chosen that life. Some people are just simply not compelled to marriage. Maybe you're not attracted to the opposite sex, and that's okay. Paul says, choose the life of celibacy, the high calling And be single by choice. But listen to this. He says, when you are single, you are choosing the vocation in the service of God. That you're compelled by a greater calling in which singlehood is wise. One of the reasons Paul is commending this is because he references in verse 26 of that same chapter, there was some sort of distress going on in Corinth. He says in verse 26, I think that in view of, uh, of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Basically saying, if you're married, stay married. If you're single, stay single. We're not quite sure what the distress is. It seems to intimate that there was some sort of persecution or expected persecution in the world at that time, and maybe certainly in Corinth, for believers. And so in vocation, in the service of God, he's saying if you get married, it may cause even greater distress because because you now have a spouse to worry about and to care for, and some sort of hardship in in this region, perhaps even the church, he's saying it's probably better for you to remain as you are. If you're single, stay single. If you're married, stay married. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32, just a little ways down, he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. He says, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, 
how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things and how to please her husband. He's saying that those who are single have a, a singular purpose and focus in responding to the call of the Lord on their life and pleasing him. And he's certainly not saying those of you who are married are unable to please the Lord. He's simply saying he understands that now you have other concerns in this world to care for. Basically acknowledging he understands that the marriage relationship is not simply made, it's simply made for this world, that in the new world to come, there's not marriage or giving in marriage, he says. And so he's recognizing that, the temporary, temporariness of marriage, even though for us it's for our lifetime and it's concrete in that, he understands in the world to come it will be different. And he says, in this world, I don't want you to be anxious. I want you to be unencumbered by the cares of married life, that you might pursue Christ with everything. And my final thought on this is singleness highlights the sufficiency of Christ. Singleness highlights the sufficiency of Christ. He is all you need. Verse 35 says, I say this for your own benefit not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. There certainly is, for those who are married or or thinking about marriage, a danger to idolize marriage, a danger to idolize your spouse. And he says, those who are single and have committed to that, you're free of that distraction. You're free of substituting someone else for Christ. He highlights that only Christ fulfills. He is all in all. Oh, yeah, but what are you saying, Pastor Jeremy? Exactly what Paul is saying. Christ is enough. If you don't realize that even in singlehood, you will drag that into your marriage and you will expect an imperfect human being to fulfill that which only Christ was meant to fill. And when you do that, you've made that person an idol. That is unhealthy for any marriage. How many times Darcy and I have counseled couples who have either idolized their spouse, and then when that spouse fails in some way, it creates conflict that they have not prepared themselves to handle. Or even in married life, they idolize the single life and bring that sort of corrupt thinking into the marriage that, oh, I can keep living my own way and doing my own thing and how much trouble and hurt that brings into their marriage when they simply see their spouse as a roommate. Only Christ fulfills. Do we believe this? It's It's such a hard thing to say, Christ is all, but then to live it out, only Christ fulfills. Yes, Paul says, even if you are married, pursue Christ as though you weren't. That's how much Paul is saying he believes this, that those who are married should pursue Christ with that same abandonment. Are you obligated to your spouse? He says, absolutely. But never forget who was meant to fulfill you. Never forget who gives you ultimate purpose. And I believe Married men and women out there, when you pursue Christ and the way he fulfills you, it actually strengthens your marriage. It makes you a better spouse. Because if you see marriage as an avenue to self-fulfillment, it creates all sorts of unhealthy expectations in relationships. And if you're single, please step away from the dangerous, I'm seeking the one, that one person, my soulmate, that, that thinking is so dangerous because it idolizes that perfect mate. Certainly there are those spouses or, or potential mates who are more adept to a relationship, more fitting for you, but there's certainly not a perfect one. Only Jesus is the one, capital T, capital O, the one. Everybody else, including future Spouses should be number two. The problem with seeking that soulmate, that one, and not only does it idolize, 
but I've seen so many single people overlook serious character flaws because they're so enamored by this idea of the one. And they're willing to overlook serious character flaws that come back to harm them simply because they are so desperate to fill that hole in their heart. If you make Jesus your one and everybody else number two, you're more likely to find the right person. His sufficiency in your life as a single demonstrates not only his ability to meet every need in your life, but as a testimony to the rest of the world as you live a fulfilled life in Christ to the wonderment and amazement of all those around you. This is us. This is how we will live. And so if you're single, maybe I can give you a couple ways to live this set apart holy life as a single. First is this, work the weight. Work the weight. I was gonna say something about it being worth the weight. If you see marriage in your future, it is definitely worth the weight to finding the right person. But can I encourage you first to work the weight? To work the weight simply means to look beyond the spouse, to pursue Christ. Work that weight. If you were waiting for a spouse, great. But maybe you'll work the weight more in line with Christ's return, that you're waiting for Christ's return and everything is viewed in that regard. So many people have asked me, Pastor Jeremy, is coronavirus and everything that's going on in the world, is, is this a sign of the end of, the, uh, of time? That the end is coming, the end is near? I believe that the end is always near. Every second that passes, the end is more near. And so I would encourage you, yes, view every decision through the lens that the end is near, that Christ's return is sooner than you imagined. View it through that lens and work the weight. When you work the weight, you understand your singleness as purposeful, not accidental and not inconsequential, but you are fully and completely useful for the kingdom of God. And so you work the weight and you pursue Christ and you become the person he wants you to be. And when you become the person he wants you to be, he will lead you or bring the right person to you. In fact, when you become the right person, you're so satisfied in Christ, you will repel all the wrong people. You will push away all those who would use or abuse because you are finding your identity in Christ. When your security is in Christ and who you are, you will have a greater filter for the right person or potential mate if God has called you to marriage. So number one, work the weight. Number two, commit to holiness. I'm gonna use the word celibacy. It's not a curse word. It's not a dirty word. But when you are single and you call yourself a Christian, the commitment is to celibacy. That is the standard God sets for all who are single because your sexuality is a gift from God. It's designed to reflect the creator's purpose for your life. And so your sexuality should fall under the lordship of Jesus Christ. If you call Jesus your king, if you say I'm a believer in Christ, then even that falls under his lordship submitted to him. The Bible says, you were bought with a price, so honor God with your body, not just with your thinking. And I say, oh, I have faith in Christ. And so your body and your conduct should reflect that. Because outside of marriage, sex is selfish. It's about self-fulfillment and satisfaction of, uh, of me. And that's why God gave it for marriage. It was to unite one man and one woman to the glory of God. So commit to holiness. Holiness in your relationships and what you watch and what you read. Keep your desires focused in the right direction and they will, or they will lead you to bondage. That's great for married couples too. To filter what you watch, what you read, what desires are they awakening you that are counter what the scripture says. And third, build holy and healthy friendships. Build holy and healthy friendships. I love to see the strong community of singles at C2 who pursue God and holiness together. It's so encouraging to me as a pastor to see single people who understand that they have purpose and they live that out, strengthening and challenging one another in the Lord, building up the church, that they don't see themselves as less than or second class within the realm of the church. 
Finally, see your singleness as a vocation for the Lord, that you're on mission. Can I say this, those of you who are single, don't idolize your singleness. Don't make that the new idol, that, that now I'm free to do whatever I want, but simply see it as you are free to do whatever the Lord calls you to do. Utilize your singleness, don't idolize it. Be generous givers. Be outstanding church leaders and volunteers. I love seeing single adults who understand the great calling on their life in singlehood that pursue missions around the world, the ability to travel and do those things. One of my heroes of faith, his name is Dwight Palmquist, he passed away recently. He was a missionary to the great country and islands of the Philippines. Dwight had an incredible story pursuing love and a relationship, but ultimately sacrificing at the altar to pursue God's calling on his life to be a missionary. I actually heard he was quite a baseball player and gave that up as well. But he became a missionary to the Philippines and in singlehood exemplified the pursuit of Christ. Many of you know the reference living in a, dan a van down by the river. Well, Dwight lived in a van, literally. He had a small storage unit where he kept stuff, but he realized that it was a waste of money and funds to own an apartment, which he would never be in as he traveled from island to island. And so he lived in a van. Speed the Light, our missions giving arm, uh, teenagers give to, our students give to, supplied him a van, actually several vans that he restored over the years many times. He committed his life as a single man to the cause of Christ. And the nation of the Philippines will never be the same because of his work, his dedication. Church, my challenge to us this morning, 1 Corinthians 7, towards the end of that chapter, verse 27, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Now, certainly he's speaking to the distress in that moment. But he says, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if you're betrothed, uh, if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles and I would spare you that. But this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And verse 31 at the end says, for the present form of this world is passing away. And that's the challenge to us that we all might adopt into our own heart, whether married or single, that we would pr pursue Christ above all things. Let us all pursue Christ. Even in this time of staying at home and social distancing, oh, I can't go to church. Well, church, you're going to church right now. You are the church. And let us all pursue Christ more and more each day because Paul almost 2000 years ago was saying the time is short. Christ is coming back. The world is changing. And he says, this world is going to pass away. All its affections and desires, the worldly things are gonna pass away. He says, so pursue the high calling of singleness, pursue the high calling of marriage, whatever the Lord is leading you to. Church, can I pray with you? And would you pray with me this morning as we close our time together? Father, in the name of Jesus, we commit ourselves to pursuing you. And Lord, you see those who even now as they are watching and listening to the sound of my voice are challenged in the pursuit of you, whether it's to be single or to be married. Father, as you strengthen every marriage, would you strengthen those who are single and clarify your call upon their life? Not simply whether to be called to be married, but what you are doing and being purposeful in their life here and now in their singleness that it has been redeemed and that to the glory of God, they will find that, discover that, and pursue that with all their heart. That the name of Jesus might be lifted high, that your kingdom might be built. Father, bless your people today, wherever they're watching from, wherever they're sitting, whenever they're watching this, bless them. And they're going and they're coming. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, Matt.